We, when I checked uh, roughly an hour ago, we had 83 registered participants. Um, so I was very pleased to see um, that um, uh, we had so many participants. Thank you once again for joining us today. Um, I will start um, with a little bit of housekeeping, um, mentioning that we have four speakers today, that all of them will be making a presentation. And then once um, we are done with the presentations, uh, we will open the floor for questions, comments, um, and the, the overall duration of the session is 90 minutes. So I'm hoping that we will have more than 30, perhaps 40 minutes for the questions. And uh, then um, we will discuss a little bit towards the end of the session, the key takeaways from the discussion. And uh, we'll be ready to wrap up. Um, so before I give the floor to the, our first speaker, I'll, I'll I would like to tell you a little bit more about the background of each one of our speakers. I will start um, in speak with the speaking order. I will start with the Baroness Biban Kidrum. Um, you can see all the speakers on the on the screen, I believe, but the videos are on. So Baroness Biban Kidrum is a British filmmaker and an advocate for children's rights in the digital world. Um, uh, in the House of Lords, Baroness Kidron sits as a crossbench peer. She sat on the House of Lords Democracy and Digital Technologies Committee inquiry and the Lords Communications uh, Select Committee. Um, is also the founder and the chair of a foundation called the Five Rights Foundation, which is a charity that works to create policy and practical solutions to build the digital world um, uh, children and young people deserve. Um, Baroness Kidron is also a member of the UN Commission for Sustainable Development, uh, of the Global Council for Extended Intelligence and the UNICEF Artificial Intelligence and Child Rights Policy Guidance Group. So you can see that um, Baroness Kidron has a wide, wide uh, experience um, and um, her views and insights on the topic will be very um, valued. Then we have Dr. Amanda Third, um, who is a research fellow in the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. Dr. Third is also the co-director of the Young and Resilient Research Center. Um, um, Dr. Third is also the research stream co-lead in, in the Center for Resilient and Inclusive Societies and a faculty associate in the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University in the USA. Um, Professor Third is an international expert in child-centered and particip participatory research, and her work investigates children's technology practices, focusing on marginalized groups and right-based approaches. Um, Professor Third has led child-centered projects to understand children's experiences of the digital age in over 70 countries, working with partners across, across corporate government, government and non-profit sectors, and of course, children and young people themselves. She has authored um, plenty of publications, um, the last one being Young People in the Digital Society in, nine, in 2019. And she's also currently co-authoring the UN um, Committee on the Right of the Child General Comment on Children's Rights in the Digital Environment. Then we have our third speaker um, on the program description, the session description, you can see the name of Nina Pick as a representative of the German Child and Youth Helpline. And fortunately, Nina yesterday informed us that uh, she's sick and, and we were so sorry to hear that. And uh, Jutta Kroll, uh, Miss Jutta Kroll agreed to join us to fill in for Nina. Um, Jutta is currently the chairwoman of the Digital Opportunities Foundation in Germany. Prior to that, she was the, actually the managing director of this foundation from um, 20, uh, 2002 and, until 2014. And from 2014 until 2016, Jutta was the managing director of the German Center for Child Protection on the, on the internet. Jutta has been a long time child rights ad advocate focusing on the child rights, um, on the digital rights of children, sorry. Jutta is a member of the IGF MAG and a co-founder co of this dynamic coalition on online 
Safety, also a co-organizer of this session. And finally, Utah is a member of several steering com, uh, boards and um, committees at European and national level. And she works very closely with the Council of Europe, uh, the European Commission, the UNESCO, and other transnational bodies. Last but not least, Cahal Delaney uh, is currently working as a head of a team at the European uh, Cybercrime Center, also known as, as EC3, which was set up, I believe, in 2013. The center is the body of the European Union that is headquarters in The Hague in the Netherlands, and, and the center coordinates cross-border law enforcement activities against uh, all forms of cybercrime, including online child sexual exploitation. And of course, the center acts as a center of technical expertise on the matter in, in this region. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Beben for the first uh, introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Over to you, Beben. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, colleagues, and, and hello to everyone who's listening. Um, I'm going to start actually in a curious way, which is uh, what happened to me sometime in April when I got a, photo, uh, a phone call from a teacher at a school where the children were remote learning. And she had had an incident where a very, very young child had uh, posted and shared uh, some child sexual abuse. And she was beside herself. And even though it was locked down, we agreed and we met in the school playground outside and over a cup of tea and a lot of tears, she explained that in addition to the particular incident, she was beside herself because she was supposed to be teaching children remotely, but she couldn't trust the technology that she was using. And she said, on the one hand, these children need to learn, they need to be in touch with, it, with each other, they need to be in touch with us, but we're putting them in an environment where almost always we feel that we're pulling them into a world in which they are not ready and is not fit for them. And I was very moved by this teacher and I asked her to keep in touch. And since then, and over the last few months, my inbox is absolutely full of uh, messages from teachers who's who have found out that I've been collating this information. Um, and some of it is very extreme. Some of it is, is, is very minor, but the sense of uh, anxiety built up uh, uh, in the teachers of a responsibility of two things pulling them between a child's right to education and their duty and wish to keep those children safe is, is, is tearing them apart. Now, I want to say that very specifically because these teachers were all in state schools. And in a very, uh, uh, and around the same time, I was approached by one of the biggest private school networks globally. In, in many, many countries across the world, nearly a hundred schools. And, uh, and the CEO of that uh, network rang me up and said, we are very proud of ourselves. Within three weeks, we are now teaching 95% of our lessons online and our kids are in school every day in all corners of the world. And I said, this is an absolute triumph. I said, what did you do about safeguarding? And he went pale nothing. He said, what should I do? So those are the two things that I want that, that have that have been with me through this pandemic. And I know that during this session, we're going to talk about lots of very different, uh, 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 lots of very different views on this subject. But for me, I think that the pandemic brought into clear focus this, this terrible normal where we are asking children to be in spaces that are simply not fit for them. And we're asking people who care to children to make decisions that there is no good outcome. Now, this is in a further complication of a context in the UK, uh, where, of course, we are a very connected society, but 1.7 million of our children do, cannot have access to an, uh, a laptop of their own for education. So we're seeing also a divide there, uh, sharing laptops with, with material that is uh, and settings that are simply not fit for purpose. And teachers who have lost contact with 
before before we went uh, before we came out of the first lockdown and of course we're going into lockdown again tomorrow but this time we're keeping children in school um sharing uh, that 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 um teachers lost contact with nearly 40% of children the government have brought in an emergency law making remote learning compulsory in UK schools. So any child who's not in school during the next wave of uh, lockdown must have access uh, to remote learning via the school, but they have done nothing, nothing to make that access safe. That is the picture for a child in the UK. At the same time, I looked at the statistics or around, um, around a particular uh, product here, which many of you will know. It's called OnlyFans. And I was looking at it because I think, as many of you know, we're bringing in legislation in the UK, uh, online harms legislation. And I was looking at it because the government keep on telling me that small companies must be exempt from this, uh, from this legislation. And OnlyFans has less than 50 employees, but it has 50 million subscribers, and it has about 700,000 content creators. And for all of those people who don't really know what it is, it sells access to naked photographs and sexual content. And in about April, uh, in April 2020, earlier this year, it found that on a single day, a third of Twitter profiles globally advertising nudes for sale or similar, uh, similar tags, appeared to belong to underage users. And many of those were using the British firm OnlyFans that would, I believe, be out of scope of the proposed legislation. And I find myself thinking that what we are creating and what the uh, pandemic has really brought into sharp relief, perhaps the things that we who, who do this every day already know, but the general public families and even policymakers have not understood, is that we're asking children, we're putting children in the center of a very toxic environment. That actually we can no longer look at this issue of child sexual abuse and, and grooming and, 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 and the most extreme forms of, of sexual violence against children as being a thing that bad actors do to individual children. But we have to start looking at what normal we create and look for the levers to make it a less toxic environment. And that in a world in which it is normal for a child to make some pocket money by selling a nudie picture of themselves, there is a, it, that actually creates an environment in which it's also normal for a child to share it on the, on the school remote learning plat pattern. And it's also then normal to pick up uh, uh, admiration and friends through that process. So really in my words here, I really wanted to, to sort of raise our eyes for a moment and say, you know, the levers of change that we must look for have to be systemic and they have to deal with some of the normals that children are finding themselves living in and the pressure of actually joining in with those new normals, as well as some of the more extreme cases that we are hearing. Now, I wanted to also touch um, on a couple of other issues, because it was in the questions for this session, I was glad to see it said, you know, what kind of harms, you know, to extend even the kind of harms uh, that children were, were, were suffering. And I think that there are two or three things that I have been witnessing in this time. Uh, from a UK context, which I imagine are relevant elsewhere. And I have found very particularly um, sort of concerning. The first one is uh, about misinformation. And I think that, you know, we are all aware specifically of the huge effect of health misinformation and, and what it actually means. And I still have in my head a headline from the newspaper of a young man who said, I guess it wasn't a hoax as his dying words in America. And, and I think that the, the depth of the misinformation around health has 
been very profound uh, for us all. But what I what caught my eye was a report earlier in the summer that said uh, from the Center of uh, Disease Control that said those people with most access to conspiracy theories are the least likely to wash their hands and social distance. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But also that children that came out in the same week as the Ofcom report on children's uh, media access, and it was of course, that children get most of their information online. And I put these two things together and felt a, a, a wave of, of, of sort of upset that the diet that we were giving children was, was uh, so, uh, so poor their access to information, which is something that is that is theirs by right to, to, to have information. And, and I felt that, the, that their story in the misinformation had not been properly told. And I think that, that you have to then extrapolate from that kind of misinformation to perhaps and the very close relation of anti-vax uh, misinformation, which has resulted in many, many millions of children getting measles unnecessarily. You know, they are the victims of this uh, misinformation. And also what we're seeing here as an increase in radicalization and through the summer again, a huge increase in, uh, in uh, hate speech and specifically uh, racially based hate speech um, in the UK. And so I felt that actually in amongst the harms that children are, are experiencing now in this world where they don't have the checkpoint of school, they don't have the checkpoint of a, of a broader society, that they do have a great deal of time inside and online, that this world that is being created of misinformation is actually should be central to our concerns and we must not see it as something that's happening solely to the adult population. And then finally, I just wanted to mention um, the question of uh, domestic violence. And this has been a huge problem uh, throughout the pandemic here in the UK. Um, not only the, the, the strategies that uh, people traditionally use to, um, to get away from their um, 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 oppressor, but but also uh, that that in the tension of of the perpetrator being indoors or losing their job or being anxious, those rates go up. So it's a sort of a, a double whammy of of abuse and inability to get out. And and we have seen huge numbers of children. Uh, calling helplines for the first time about violence to themselves or indeed in the in the family context. And I think that that this is something where there are some very, very good services, there are remote services, there are helplines that have been absolutely fundamental to their well-being and to either getting them out or supporting them through those situations. And I think that that's possibly where I'd like to, to end to say that in all my criticism of the, of the environment created uh, by the technology that children are, are using, is we could so easily flip it to create a technology that would bring children their rights, help them flourish, keep them safe. And that in the end, the battle is really about responsibility, about the business model and about legislation and about mandating a lowest bar of behavior that would actually protect children through these sorts of issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pippen. Very interesting. Um, you touched upon a wide range of aspects that I think we'll go back to when we open the floor. Uh, but uh, your remarks, I think, um, um, sort of um, link very well with what Amanda, I believe, is planning to say. So over to you, Amanda. You can build and expand on, on what some of the remarks we just heard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for organizing this panel. And, and thanks, Bebens, for some wonderful opening comments. 
very early in the life of the current pandemic, it was clear that in comparison to other populations, such as the elderly, children were not particularly vulnerable to contracting COVID-19. Even so, this crisis has profoundly impacted children around the world. In just one sign that the impacts on children are significant, uh, children's helplines in high-income countries have reported uh, increased Amanda, you were muted. Suddenly, I don't know why someone muted you. I just got a message that the host had muted me. Did you oh. hear me? <laughs> <laughs> now, can you can you go backward like a couple of seconds? Um, yeah, so I was just saying that the crisis has profoundly impacted children. And one sign of this is that 25%, uh, that helplines are experiencing a 25% increase in volume uh, in, in, in children accessing their services. So internationally, the pandemic has registered as a crisis. So I just wanna begin with two notes about how we might think about crisis in relation to children, their rights and technology. Firstly, the word crisis comes from the Greek, but in the original meaning, the emphasis is not so much on the cataclysmic event, but on the process of taking the necessary to decisions to deal with the cataclysmic event. Crisis demands that we envision the change that we want to see and go after it aggressively. I'm shortly going to suggest that the time is now to centre children's rights as we take decisions about the important role that technology has to play in navigating crises. Secondly, COVID-19 will be a formative experience for this generation of children, but it's unlikely to be the only major crisis that shapes their sense of their world and their sense of safety. For Australian children, the pandemic was immediately preceded by the national emergency of devastating bushfires. For children in the Pacific, the pandemic was followed by vicious cyclones. And in Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, catastrophic floods are currently compounding the effects of the pandemic. In short, as we make decisions, we must be very careful not to constrain our thinking to individual crises, though they might grab our attention. We must use this moment to think expansively about how to address the intersecting crises that shape children's lives, both now and in the future, be it those that confront us starkly or those that are burning more slowly, such as the climate crisis. Because if children's rights are challenged now, this is not a temporary situation. Throughout the pandemic, there's been a strong emphasis on managing the medical dimensions of the pandemic and its response. However, for children, as for adults, the pandemic has been more than a health crisis. It has been and continues to be a crisis in children's social worlds. Emerging research shows that for many children, the pandemic uh, constituted an unprecedented disruption to their everyday routines, their relationships, their sense of security, certainty, and fundamental safety. The confidence that comes from predictable routines or the reliable comfort of strong and stable parents and relatives was suddenly thrown into disarray. So uh, my team's research to develop child-centered indicators for violence prevention online and offline in the Philippines shows that children's concept of safety depends very much on the stability of their immediate relationships. Or we might say that safety is social and relational. So children's safety might, have, might already have said to have been compromised by mere fact of the scale of disruption in their social networks. Compounding this and among other factors, children have also been exposed to streams of information of varying quality via social media and video sharing platforms as Beban was just indicating, but also via the fragments of news or nervous conversations between parents and carers that they overheard. It's no wonder then that children are reporting heightened distress. But recent research such as that on your screen at the moment shows that the possibility that children or their family members might contract the virus is very low down on children's list of immediate concerns. Rather, they report a heightened sense of worry, stress, feeling trapped, frustration, anger, sadness, loss and grief and of not knowing how to deal with these often new and very powerful emotions. They feel disconnected from their peer networks, which for many is a vital source for their well-being and their resilience. 
They struggled to adapt to online education and much of the online on, of the transition to online learning took place on the fly and as such didn't wasn't always underpinned by good pedagogy as again as Beepen has just talked about. And family tensions caused by being in close quarters with the same people day in and day out, often exacerbated by the financial pressures in families that faced job losses, unstable work or business closures, and so on. Through this period of momentous disruption, technology has played a more and more prominent role in the lives of many children. And of course, we have to qualify this statement with the very careful acknowledgement that not all children have regular and reliable access to technology. And this raises a very important set of issues about how such children can enact their rights in the context of a pandemic that's unfolding in the digital age. Um, there is a very real possibility that crises such as the present one will further marginalise those that already experience digital exclusion. But for those children with access, while there are concerns that rapid increases in, their, in children's screen time during the pandemic have exposed them to increased risks of harm, and I'll say more about this in a moment, technology has also provided a crucial point of continuity and connection for children. It's enabled them to maintain connection with peers, to stay engaged at some level with their schooling, and it provides a very important means of relaxation uh, and entertainment. But many of the technology-based strategies that we've put in place to sustain life under the pandemic have been assembled quickly, without due attention either to the risks of harm or how to maximize the full potential of technology to support children's sense of safety and well-being in this time of disruption. Now, more than ever, despite the urgency of the issues that we confront, it's important that we pause and step carefully. What then of children's rights? How should we think about children's rights in the context of this pandemic and other crises? While children's rights to physical and mental health is obviously uh, right to mental health is, is obviously most affected both negatively and positively by technology during a pandemic. We, were, we must remember that there is much more at stake than their right to health. The pandemic unfolding in a digital age has significant implications for children's rights to information, education, privacy, identity, rest, leisure, play, an adequate standard of living, protection from forms of physical and mental abuse and exploitation, and much more. It, um, it also differentially impacts the rights of children living with disability, adoptees, refugees, and those in institutional care or situations of vulnerability. So as the global community responds, we have to remember the indivisibility of children's rights. Um, as the convention stipulates, and as the team uh, led by the Five Rights Foundation um, has insisted on while drafting uh, the, the UNCRC general comment on children's rights in the digital environment, a document that we hope will guide our thinking in relation to child rights, technology, and the pandemic. There is no hierarchy of children's rights. They, um, uh, they must be progressively realised in combination. So we must resist the temptation to only think about children's right to health. With this in mind, I want to briefly reflect on some of the ways that children's rights are impacted by technology in this time of crisis and what this means for their safety. So we know that children don't distinguish the online and the offline in the ways that adults often do, but rather they move flexibly across online and offline spaces, and they often interact, learn and participate both in online and offline settings simultaneously. Nonetheless, the majority of children primarily use the internet and digital technology to support and sustain face-to-face -face interactions. Children have emphasized that during the pandemic, while technologically mediated relationships have been important to them, they can't replace their face-to-face -face interactions. And I think it's useful here to remember that under the conditions of the pandemic, our communication has had to be very intentional rather than incidental. There's no bumping into people and having a casual chat. You have to reach out and communicate. So children are saying that when their engagement with other people and their world moves solely online, they have diminished social interactions. It's not the case that, technology, that 
the technological simply substitutes for face-to-face -face interaction when physical contact becomes impossible. Being unable to interact with their peers challenges children's well-being. Indeed, to the extent that the pandemic impacts children's right to health, it's their mental health, a form of safety whose importance is often underestimated, that's perhaps most of concern. A major challenge for us is how do we augment existing platforms and technology-based services to support children's mental health, well-being and their, and their rights to safety? We know that the risks of harm to children online, sorry, we know that the risks of harm to children online are likely to have increased during the pandemic. Research shows that increased time online does indeed augment the likelihood that children will encounter risks of harm. And while we know, we also know that more time online enables children to develop their digital literacies and their capacities to manage these risks, arguably they've not had the opportunities to do so with the right structures of support and guidance around them, given that they've been largely reliant on family members who themselves are in crisis. Purely by spent, the fact of spending more time online, the possibility children are exposed to forms of digitally mediated harm have increased. We know that for those children who were already vulnerable to forms of violence, the risks are accentuated. For the vast majority of children, the consequence of the pandemic has been that they spend increased amounts of time at home, and not all children's homes are safe spaces that support and sustain them. The domestic violence community, for example, is deeply concerned about rising rates of intimate partner violence and the effects that this, might, that this is having on children. Furthermore, the, the usual structures of visibility and face-to-face -face accountability that regulate the behaviours of perpetrators of violence are currently compromised. We need to think creatively in earnest and across sectors about how we use technology to identify and counter the violence that's taking place behind closed doors. And we need to think in even more creative ways about how to leverage technology to support child victims of violence whether they're victims online or offline or both. If there's a glimmer of hope, it's that these issues, which the child protection community has known about and advocated on for many years, are finally more visible in public and, and policy debates. There's cause, uh, there's cause, I think, for cautious optimism that this pandemic provides an opportunity to advance right, children's right to protection from very serious forms of violence. One effect I think of this pandemic has been to challenge most people's sense of privacy. Living in close quarters is very challenging. But of course, again, by virtue of intensified time online, children are ever more exposed to the not always explicit or well explained uh, data collection practices of technology companies with potentially significant implications for their right to privacy. These incursions on privacy have only been compounded by contact tracing apps and other surveillance technologies that are implemented to protect populations. But if surveillance of the general population has increased, the pri privacy rights of those children who live in abusive families are severely compromised. Again, as, uh, as Biban alluded to, technology in that context potentially amplifies the mechanisms of control that are available to perpetrators of child abuse and other forms of exploitation and violence. While the way forward is anything but clear, we can't shy away from these difficult questions. Crises, and this is especially true of a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic, tend to throw us into the immediacy of the present. They obscure the past and the future. Across cultures, children are seen to represent the future. To center the needs of children as we address crises then, would be to shift us beyond a sole focus on the present moment of disruption and to bring the future into play. It's, so thinking about children, centering children is a vital tool in counteracting the tendency for short termism. If children are seen to represent the future, they also represent our collective hopes for a better world. Indeed, alongside their fears, children are also articulating a range of positive experiences as a consequence of the pandemic. 
So far, the consultations have shown that amidst the challenges, children have appreciated the opportunity to spend more time with family, um, outside the usual routines. They've found strength in their connection uh, with those family members, and they've learned to appreciate the small things. And many also have enjoyed, even relished, being online. In short, if technology can undermine children's rights, it's also clear that it has potential to sustain children's rights in a time of crisis. And yet we're yet to still imagine all the ways that technology can be harnessed to do so. As we proceed, it's important that we don't lose sight of the ways that this moment might enable us to invent new purposes for technology, which enable children and their communities to navigate crises more effectively, but also technologies that can support us to work towards a world in which children and the adults in their lives can lead more equitable and fulfilling lives. There's no time like now for thinking about how to leverage technology for children's rights. The pandemic has shown us unequivocally that this task is both urgent and necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I was I was busy taking notes, so <laughs> I love, um, uh, it, it's all very interesting. And and once again, um, I think it's a good compliment to the remarks that Beben ma made at the very beginning. And and um, I I took note of some key comments that you made, and I'd like to go back to it when we open the floor. Um, before I pass on the baton to Jutta, I would like to remind all the participants that there is a Q&A section where they can write down their questions for the speakers when we are done with the presentation. So far, we have four questions. Um, so please uh, feel free to write down the questions and we will go back to them once we are done with the, uh, two, um, the two speakers that, that, that remain. Um, to speak. So, Yuta, over to you, um, and then we will finish with Kahal. Thank you very much. I'll mute myself. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Laure, and uh, I have shared my screen now. Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay. I see someone nodding, so that's fine. Um, as can you, sorry, can you, can you make it um, the the huge screen because we we can see the detail? Hey, hey, you are. Thank you. Wonderful. So my name is Jutta Kroll. I'm heading the project Children's Rights and Child Protection in the Digital World for four years now, and I'm happy to take over for my colleague Nina Perk from. Uh, the German helpline. Um, we have been working within the project with helplines from Germany um, in regard of their compliance with the GDPR and also uh, at the same time respecting the rights of the child. Um, and the German helpline Nummer gegen Kummer, which could be translated like a uh, line against sorrow and pain, um, has been one of the helplines that we've been working with and uh, all the helplines in Germany have intensified their work during the pandemic and some even started uh, with online counseling during the pandemic to reach out to children. Uh, some have been set up newly and they all have uh, 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 great needs to discuss about the, the cases they are facing uh, and the reports they received from the helpline, uh, from the children. Just to give you an overview, the, the Nummer gegen Kummer has a child helpline via telephone and a parent's helpline via telephone, and they do online counseling for children and youth. This is done by adults and also by peers. So there are several times where the children can reach out to counseling by um, by young people and they can reach out to counseling uh, given by adults. Um, so uh, looking at the figures, you can see that in all three parts of the work they are doing, they had a huge increase uh, during the pandemic. These are statistics uh, till April. So for the time that 
um, children and families have been in lockdown and uh, especially, <clears throat> especially an increase was there in the online counseling for children, but also uh, in the parents uh, telephone hotline where it increased uh, by 54% from March to April. Having a look, a deeper look into the details, the helpline uh, remained open for all the time and they increased even the times when children can reach out, extended them during um, April with plus 10 hours per week for the child helpline and the chat, and also 30 hours per week for the parents helpline too to address all that, uh, that calls um, and messages they, they received. Um, the, the details of the reports they had to address show a bit different um, data like we heard from Bieben before. So they had expected to have more contacts about domestic violence, about grooming and potentially harmful content, but that was that increase was not as much as, as was expected. But they had in, an increase uh, in, in reports about violence, which was physical, emotional, and also sexual violence. Uh, then children had a, a lot of um, um, a lot of reports uh, or just questions about love and relationship online and also about cyberbullying. So it was not only harm, it was also like a positive experience where they had questions regarding that. And then uh, the question that came from parents like about gaming, data protection and excessive use were less relevant for the children, but they came in from the parents. Um, we have, I have here some, got some from Nina, some examples uh, that from questions that parents put to the helpline. This was related to where, where can I find uh, suitable content for children? What might be the possible risks if, if my children are more and more hours online? And how can I talk to my children about these risks? Um, Parents, just many parents felt just overwhelmed with the situations. They were frustrated. They got feelings like, am I a bad parent? What shall I do? Um, but also very, very uh, expressive uh, issues like uh, a son sent some nude pictures to someone uh, he met online. Now he's bullied. Uh, how can I help him to be protected? and uh, uh, issues that are not only related to the pandemic, but that also came up during this time of crisis. And uh, uh, the 13-year-old daughter having a relationship online to an adult, and how could I cope with that situation? Things that children reported were somehow different. They, they felt they are behind with their tasks for school. Their parents were not able to help them. So, they are afraid of the future, but also parents who took away the phone so they could not be able to stay in contact with their, with their peers and, and felt, um, felt angry, but also disappointed about the situation. Uh, then children that their parents were still working, were not in lockdown, so the children felt alone at home, were scared and that sad and couldn't even do something about that. And then also children who lived in families where their, the parents had problems with each other, where there was fight, and so they were afraid of the situation. So it, it's a huge picture of different issues the helpline had to deal with. It, it was not in all ways the thing that they had expected, which happened during lockdown and the pandemic. And we even got reports from, from another whole, um, helpline who, who said uh, that they got more reports about physical sexual abuse that happened before the pandemic. So these children somehow during the pandemic when they came were not in, in physical contact with their with the offender, they feel, felt more confident to report to a helpline to search for counseling. So they somehow opened up in that situation when they were not in direct contact 
for example, in a sports club or even at school or kindergarten with the offender that they felt scared about. So we have different um, developments in that situation. And I do think we are still in, in the situation that we, we have not enough means, not sufficient means to deal with the situation. Helplines are overwhelmed. They are, have a lot of reports. Uh, parents were overwhelmed and we, we still need to develop um, strategies to, to ensure that people, can, that children can, can benefit from the rights that are dedicated to them, that they can exercise their rights and at the same time being safe. Thank you so much for listening and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jutta. Uh, very interesting remarks. Uh, so we started with, uh, oh, I, should, I should put on my video. We started with Beben and, and Amanda who painted the broad picture around different, a wide range of, of children's rights. Now we have the perspective of a, a frontline or service provider, a helpline that is attending the calls of the, of the children and you share some very interesting data that we can comment uh, in a few minutes. And now we also will have the perspective of a service provider, frontline provider, which is a law enforcement agency. Uh, and, then, and then we can um, have a very interesting discussions around uh, some of your comments and, and some of the data you're sharing. Over to you, Kahal, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Laure. So just let me share my screen. So my name is Cahal Delaney, as uh, Mary Laura introduced me at the, the beginning, and I'm the team leader at Europol dealing with transsexual exploitation and abuse online and offline related crimes. <clears throat> so what I, I, I wanted to pick up on from the other speakers and from the, the, uh, the presentations that have been made so far is that law enforcement uh, is, is uh, not always viewed in terms of, uh, of what we do in, in relation to children's rights. But in, in this area in particular, um, we are very much focused uh, on the child and their rights uh, and their status uh, as, a, as a victim when, these, uh, when crimes are, are committed against them, um, particularly in relation to, to sexual exploitation and abuse. And we take our role as being inherently uh, protective of those rights and trying to enforce those rights uh, as, as, as Dr. Third, as Amanda said, um, their right to, to protection and their right to, to privacy. These are uh, very much central to what we are trying to do uh, within law enforcement when we are pursuing those who uh, would exploit and abuse uh, sexually uh, children uh, online and offline uh, and uh, to make those children to try to protect them uh, from that, that abuse and to protect it them from it continuing into the future as well. So uh, in effect, the way that we, uh, the way that we look at this at, at Europol, um, Europol is a, an agency which is, the, is intended to support law enforcement throughout Europe in, in their work in different crime areas where two or more member states are, uh, are affected by the, by the crime in particular and, and uh, by different um, matters that need to be investigated. And the way that we, we look at doing this is through these four, uh, four different steps, four different uh, areas, I won't call them steps because they don't necessarily follow one another. But you have, a, most importantly, um, collaboration. So the, the collaboration that we have with, uh, with our law enforcement partners, um, collaboration that, that we have with the, the public and the, the private sector, uh, with uh, non-governmental organizations and with the different stakeholders who are involved in the different crime areas in our area in particular in relation to uh, in relation to children and their uh, sexual exploitation and following from that then we have uh, an operational response which is uh, obviously a huge part of the law enforcement uh, response is to actually do something about what we are being told is happening uh, and take action in relation to that. And our, our role, rather, your part, is to support uh, the member states' law enforcement agencies in uh, uh, taking those actions 
uh, and trying to ensure with them that the best possible um, result uh, comes from those actions. Then we have the strategic response, which is looking at the, the picture of what is going on uh, and how we can use that picture to better protect children uh, and also to contribute to the decisions that are being made by policymakers uh, and by, um, by decision makers in, in both in the member states and at EU level uh, to, uh, to inform them about how things can improve uh, and what are the steps that need to be taken to do that. And then prevention and education, which is one of the very few areas that Europol reaches out directly to the public uh, uh, for, uh, and that's providing different materials, advice, uh, and um, ways for the public to protect themselves, protect their children, and become more educated about what, uh, what is happening in this area uh, so that they can do that. So in terms of operational response, um, we, as I said, are very focused on, uh, on the children and that means that we focus first on the identification of the victim. That in any investigation we have, uh, almost the first question we ask is, where is the victim and how can we help them? And we sometimes ascertain that through different, uh, different conventional uh, methods of investigation uh, with our with the partners, with the agencies that have asked for our support. Um, we have victim identification function at Europol that, uh, that we have built over the last number of years. Um, it is the, uh, the part of the, the team that drives the victim identification task forces, which take place every year, what is taking place at the moment. And uh, we use the information that we gather from that victim identification process and the regular investigation process. Uh, when I say we, I mean all of the investigators who were involved in this. Uh, and we um, use that information to try to determine where a child is so that we can uh, enable them to be reached by the regular, by the, the national law enforcement agency that's responsible in the jurisdiction. And doing that also involves intelligence analysis uh, and technical support intelligence analysis for the information that we store in our databases about uh, the offenders and their activities and so on. And the technical support, if we uh, either support on the ground, on the spot, or at your pod headquarters with, uh, with uh, the technical expertise and, and knowledge that, uh, that our specialists have in, in this particular area. And the result of that uh, during the uh, during the lockdown period was that we were able to support remotely uh, several uh, operations. One uh, examples are here. Uh, there was a case in Italy uh, that began around the middle or the very early April, uh, where uh, our colleagues in Australia discovered uh, material online that they believed was recent abuse of a child. And through the examination of that material and the cooperation of several different jurisdictions that we coordinated, several different law enforcement agencies in Europe, uh, it was possible to uh, discover the particular region in Italy where the, we believe that the abuse was taking place. And then the colleagues in, uh, in Italy uh, were able to inform their local um, investigators there about the circumstances of the case and the information that they had relating to the suspect. And ultimately, that led to the identification of the suspect and the victim, a young girl, a child uh, who had been abused by him uh, within 10 days of those videos being posted online, uh, which is quite a, quite a significant achievement in, in that particular difficult circumstances. Um, another example was, uh, was with Spain, where similarly, the, uh, the national um, National Agency were able to conduct a, a search remotely based on information that they had previous re previously received and information that we had added to, uh, again, to, to rescue a, a male child, in that case, a boy, uh, and to uh, discover the identity of his abuser as well and take him uh, before the courts to be dealt with according to justice. And then also we had a, a case in France where um, we actually supported on the ground with the technical and intelligence uh, uh, support uh, leading to the arrest of a suspect there and the, uh, the, um, the safety of, of two of the children, two children that he had been abusing himself. So 
each of those are just illustrations of the the um, the let the extent of the efforts that we will go to uh, in order to, to ensure that uh, children who are being abused online and who are being uh, whose abuse is being posted online uh, that we will do everything that we possibly can to support uh, the law enforcement agencies in Europe and beyond uh, in ensuring that that information gets to where it needs to be acted upon uh, and that children are made safe as a result of that. And this is just some uh, additional information in relation to the, to the Italian case that I spoke about uh, already. That the information that comes from, from those cases is added to uh, the information that we already have at Europol. And we have, uh, as I said, the image and video, video uh, analysis system, which is uh, for victim identification. And in that system, at the moment, we have more than 50 million uh, images and videos that are unique. Uh, these are not, uh, there are not multiple copies in there. These are unique uh, images and videos uh, of child sexual exploitation and abuse. And because of the efforts that we have made over the last number of years um, with our, our partners through uh, vehicles like the Victim Identification Task Force, which we hold at least once a year, sometimes twice, we've managed to examine just 20% uh, of that material. And that's to give you an idea of the, the scale uh, of the problem that we face in relation to the amount of material that is out there. And I know that NECMEC uh, have, uh, have given statistics previously in relation to possibly that many and more uh, images and videos appearing online every year as well. And the difficulty, of course, uh, for any child whose abuse has been recorded and whose abuse has been distributed is that there is uh, every possibility that they will, uh, at some stage, at least be fearful that they will be uh, recognized on the street because uh, by somebody who has viewed material in relation to them, who has seen uh, material in which they were exploited and abused. Uh, and that they, that person could recognize them on the street. And this, uh, through survivor surveys uh, carried out by the um, C3N in Canada and, uh, and other uh, collaborators, have established that this is a very real fear for victims. Uh, and uh, you can see how damaging and difficult that would be for them as they go through their lives. And what we, what we do uh, at Europol is... Uh, we have a very strict privacy and, and data protection regime. And within uh, our own team, that privacy and data protection regime is, is very strong. Um, we, because we recognize the importance of the, uh, the information that we receive, not only in terms of criminal intelligence, but that it is a material in which children have been abused and in which uh, we want to do our very best to ensure that those children uh, and the abuse material that is there is not any further exposed than it absolutely needs to be and is only seen by those who need to see it and that there is not a possibility for those children to be re-victimized re in the context of the, uh, the investigations that we support and in the ways that we support them as well. So in looking then at the strategic response in relation to uh, what we saw during the pandemic, we produced three public reports uh, during that time. Uh, the first one is catching the virus. Uh, the second one and that was at the beginning of April, uh, just within four weeks of the lockdown beginning. Then we had uh, beyond the pandemic, which was at the end of April. And then we had a dedicated report in relation to child sexual exploitation and abuse, exploiting isolation, that was published on the 19th of June this year. And in, in each of those reports, what we wanted to, to do um, as, a, as a team was to emphasize what the impact in that, in what the crisis seemed to be having in relation to children uh, and how uh, it could be the case that um, that both the public and decision makers could be properly educated about it and, and, and the steps could be identified for them uh, to try to mitigate the damage that was being done during that point. So we looked at uh, in uh, 
in the first report, we looked at what the situation appeared to be with information that we got from our law enforcement partners uh, and from the various other sources. Uh, and we saw that there did seem to be a problem. And I won't reiterate again what uh, Bivan and, and Dr. Third have already said about the factors, because these were ones which uh, were pointed out by experts at the time as likely uh, to be uh, to be come obvious during the pandemic in relation to the children themselves and now which Dr. Third has said is uh, have become um, possible to verify basically as things that uh, that factors that were in play uh, in relation to the vulnerability of children. In the second uh, report then we looked at uh, what the the future situation was likely to be and in the dedicated report, and then we looked at the uh, a whole range of factors and data sources to try to establish what the full picture was uh, and how that picture could be mitigated uh, through the actions of both law enforcement policy and decision makers and the, the actions of the public themselves. And what we, uh, what we did from that information was then that we, prevent, we produced prevention and education advice for, for, the, for the public uh, and for obviously um, the different levels of the public, the carers, the parents uh, and the children themselves and working in collaboration with uh, bodies like the safety commissioners in an office in Australia, uh, producing the, the third item there, the COVID-19 global online safety advice for parents and carers in the European context. So adapting the product that they had already produced producing videos uh, and in information, um, yeah, information uh, for for the different levels uh, of uh, of teachers, parents, uh, and uh, children to uh, inform them about what it is that could be done to help them to not be vulnerable in this situation. And I think going back to what has been said already, um, the the difficulty of potentially uh, damaging children's privacy during this time and the right to privacy um, is for those children who have access uh, to the internet uh, is very much dependent on having access to this type of information uh, where parents can be educated about what it is that they need to do in engaging with their children and conversing with them and discussing with them what it is uh, they, that, that a parent is trying to do and protecting them, that they're not trying to take away their rights, but rather they're trying to supplement them uh, and strengthen them um, by, giving, by telling the child what it is that they're trying to do and including them in that conversation. Uh, and by doing that to hopefully motivate the child to take this as something that they, that they also have a part in, that they have a role in, uh, and that they need to understand and to take seriously in order to protect their own rights in the future and be able to do that as well. In the end of the day, uh, it's very much the case that whatever way we look at this, there is no way that law enforcement can solve this problem on their own. And we don't want to solve it on our own. We want to solve it in collaboration with, with partners, um, uh, whether that those partners in the public sector, in the private sector, uh, with non-governmental organizations, uh, with bodies like uh, the International uh, Governance Forum and the, the Dynamic Coalition. We want to be working with you uh, in order to solve this problem because it's only by doing that, by having all of us working on it together, that we can be effective and that we can produce a result which at the end of the day will protect the rights uh, of, of children, whether they are to health, uh, whether they are to protection or whether they are to privacy. And that's something that we as, uh, as a law enforcement agency at Europol are very focused on and that we in a, as a community of investigators who are very much um, focused uh, on protecting children and protecting their rights uh, also want to achieve as well. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for your attention as well. Thank you very much, Kahal. Uh, once again, very interesting. And thank you for bringing in the perspective of the victims also. And um, perhaps for those on, who are not familiar with this field of work, um, starting your, your presentation uh, by mentioning that uh, the work that you do um, uh, as an agency is victim uh, focused and centered is, is um, uh, something that shouldn't be taken for granted for all law enforcement agencies, especially 15, 20 years ago. And this has 
been uh, something, uh, um, um, a very positive uh, progress uh, made by major law enforcement agencies at national, regional, international level that we have witnessed and we thank you for that. Um, so, um, and, and also thank you for um, um, ending on a positive note, uh, mentioning the fact that this issue is really, um, you know, about collaboration. If we're thinking of, of responses and solutions, we need to think collectively. And I think this panel is actually um, a good um, sort of example of that because we are bringing in expertise across sectors from academia, from NGO, from law enforcement, um, so that we can all together um, um, put our brains together to look at the problem and the solutions. So um, I'd like to go back um, to some questions that were um, spelled out in the Q&A section that are actually linked to those points. Uh, they are, I mean, they're all very interesting. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start uh, perhaps with one on, on photo DNA because it's, sort of linked to the, the topic of the volume of, of CSAM that uh, Kahal was um, referring to right now. And um, so uh, John Carr is asking if, if you're aware that uh, what is happening at the European Parliament in relation to the use of a, pro a proactive tool that is called photo DNA and, and potentially its ban um, and, and the ban of other proactive tools to detect grooming and, and uh, other illegal content. And, and uh, John is saying that the pandemic is reminding us or has reminded us that um, those tools are very important. And, and uh, can we have uh, your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know, Kahal of some other speakers. I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, if not Kahal, other speakers. Yes, Yuta. Um, yes, thank you for giving me the floor. I, I do think this is also related to the, the other question that we got in the uh, question and answer se uh, section as well from my Maimuna Jeng, I hope I pronounced that correctly, yes. who is asking whether these practices like using photo DNA to detect uh, child sexual abuse material might also be a kind of censoring uh, the sexual expression of people, especially feminists, she, she or he writes on the internet. I do, and I do think it's very really important to explain from the start that we are not talking about censorship in any way. We are talking about fighting child sexual abuse material with the means of, of those tools like photo DNA. So that is not about uh, suppressing freedom of expression in, in the other way. It's ensuring that children's rights, not only to safety, but also they also have the right to freedom of expression. And we need to ensure that, that children can exercise that, that right in a safe environment. So I, I don't think we are, we are, we can achieve something if we are talking about whether it's censorship or not. We need technical tools, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that Cathal can go more into details how helpful these tools are, and that they are especially, as far as I know, and I'm not a technician, photo DNA has nothing to do with mass surveillance. It's not like surveying or monitoring the interaction of people. It's about dis uh, it's uh, discovering files and images, but you can explain better, I think. Yeah, I, I'll take that as well, um, Mary Doris. Now, I, I have to be a little careful uh, because at the end of the day, your policy is an EU agency, so we're not going to comment on any political developments uh, or anything like that. And, and I think John, John knows that as well. Um, so let me talk a little bit uh, about the, the technical uh, issue that you, you brought up. Uh, so um, the, the purpose of these types of tools uh, is that they will detect uh, material relating to child sexual exploitation and abuse in platforms where, where that is being distributed. Uh, and it, as um, you just said, it is not, uh, they, they are not being used in order to suppress freedom of speech, but rather to, for a very particular defined purpose, in order to, to detect this material and to inform law enforcement about it, which, uh, which uh, reaches the law enforcement member states, 18 of them, through Europol, 
in relation to uh, referrals that are made through the uh, mandatory reporting in the US uh, and through the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children there. Uh, and those number of referrals have been increasing the last number of years uh, to a significant extent. Um, in relation to what is uh, the, the, the legislation that was proposed by the, by the Commission earlier this year, um, Europol obviously applauds the fact that the Commission produced this legislation uh, and uh, then respects the, the, the role of the, the other parliamentary and council institutions in deciding uh, how that legislation is to be implemented. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, if what I understand, I'm not defending the legislation, but what I understand is that what it seeks to do is to maintain the status quo and not to go beyond what is already uh, the situation uh, and to close a gap between uh, legislation which uh, comes in today into force at the, on the 20th of December this year uh, and uh, other legislation that the Commission hopes to introduce next year in order to, uh, to close this, um, this gap basically in, in the law that it otherwise exists. So it's, um, yeah, that's, that's what our position on it is. And that's the, the technical aspect that, uh, that I think needs to be understood about it uh, and um, about the other technologies that are being used to do the same thing at the moment. Thank you very much, Pip. And you raised your hand, you wanted to add something about this topic? Um, yeah, I just, I think, well, first of all, before I speak again, I do want to actually thank Carl and all the colleagues at uh, Europol for what they do on the front line. And we really recognize that that's different from those of us who talk about policy. And thank you very much. Um, but but I, I think um, uh, I can make a political point, uh, just like you can't. Um, and, and, and I think I'd like to make a, a slightly broader political point, which is I am disappointed that uh, policymakers have sort of been backed into a corner about talking about freedom of speech versus uh, child sexual uh, uh, um, material protection and, and, and the other protections that we seek. And I, I just want to make this analogy. It's like if in the milk system we put a little bit of poison and every 10,000th house over breakfast someone got sick, you know, we wouldn't be sitting there going on the one hand freedom and on the other hand, um, you know, protection. I mean, it is uh, we simply don't have the right framing in this virtual world. And the framing that I would like to see policymakers take, because I accept some of the arguments about the tool itself. But let's do it this way and say, if you cannot do your very profitable business without carrying you know, industrial level of child sexual abuse, then you're not fit to, you're not fit to trade. So I see it as a business practice issue and that the solutions then will have a lot more attention and the solutions will have to be much more effective. And unless you can do that, it's, it's, it's a not fit purpose. And I haven't, you know, and I, and again, and I think I said it at the end of my opening remarks, you know, this technology is marvelous. Look at what we're doing. We're in different parts of the world all speaking together. You know, the truth of the matter is we've got to have a much more uh, uh, zero kind of attitude to this and say, it's not fit for purpose. So what are you going to do with it? And maybe new tools and maybe these tools and maybe some restrictions to their own services and their own spread but it's not about freedom of speech, yeah? That, that is not an unqualified freedom against all other freedoms, and these are private companies. They are not, you know, they may be the public highway, that's something we've allowed, but they are private companies. They're not fit for trade if this is the trade that they enable. So can, can I, I, I'd like to jump in and, and, and uh, link what you're just saying, Beban, to a question that Sonia Livingston is asking, which I think is very relevant. It's, it's uh, about solutions. And, and Sonia is saying that the panel has raised a very troubling set of problems uh, facing, um, sorry, I missed, uh, oh God, I, I lost the question. Where is it? Um, 
my apologies, I lost track of the, uh, facing uh, a very troubling set of problems facing children during the pandemic. So to your point, Beben, what immediate actions um, do, can, can you call for from the government or from the industry? Can you think of something very specific? Um, you were talking about the industry, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to be careful because the short term things that we call for are just not the whole solution. And, and it's always a very difficult place to be. I mean, I think, you know, I would like to see a rigorous application of their own uh, age restrictions. Yeah, right now. Uh, you know, so it doesn't solve the whole problem, but it does mean that eight year olds aren't using uh, services that they just don't have the maturity to deal with. Um, I think that there are certain parts of their design they should disable immediately. And uh, and I've talked to some of them about this, but but and I and I and and I maybe I could just stop on this exact point, which is, you know, why is it that it is routine and normalized that uh, strange adults are introduced to children as re as friend requests? I mean, in what world does that make sense when at the front line, you know, colleagues are trying to, to deal with grooming and, and child sexual abuse. And actually, I had a recent conversation with a, a senior uh, safeguarding police officer in one of our uh, uh, nations. And, uh, and we talked about and he went back and looked at past cases and he actually started seeing how kids were being introduced you know, so through these benign, apparently, things, this is just a, a commercial thing for their own network effect. So we've got to, you know, it should not be that a child is offered friend requests of adult strangers, period. They don't need it to make the system work. So I think, I mean, my long-term thing is that we have to start doing um, impact assessments on services. We have to see where the risks are, take out the risk, because the risk is a harm that hasn't happened yet. And that would mean that our colleagues who are dealing with harm at the other end, yeah, would have a whole lot less to do if we made it uh, a little bit more difficult and a little bit less sticky in the first place. So, I mean, I actually think we need a wholesale regulation. I think we need algorithmic oversight. I think the other big thing we have to really make a difference on here is the difference between individual pieces of content and enabling them to spread. These are two different processes one is a bad actor and one is a business model. And, you know, allowing, enabling that spread is also criminal, in my view. So I think there are things, and I don't want to take all the time, but there are literally a whole host of things. And, 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 um, and in terms of five rights, you know, who I'm talking on behalf of, we actually have a, a very good publication on our website saying priorities for the online harms bill, which doesn't cover all of this, but covers a few pieces of it. Thank you. So we're talking here about algorithmic amplification, right? Yeah. As a yes. model. I mean, if you if you if you think of me sitting in this room alone, whatever I put up, yeah, you know, only those who really really try and come and find and see it. If you then deliver it and spread it around the world, therein lies a problem. So, however bad, if it's isolated in one place, yeah, uh, and this is something that that I don't think policymakers are quite yet attuned to. But a lot of the problem we have here, whether it's misinformation or child sexual abuse, is about spread, is about network effect, and actually is about automating the bad instead of automating the good. Very well, automating the, the bad. So to move on, because we have another two questions which I think are uh, very relevant. One is about the dark web. And again, perhaps um, that should go to Kahal. And another one is from Abilash about self-generated images and regulations. So the, the one from um, Siva Subramanian uh, Mutusami is um, asking what is the proportion of these crimes in the dark web to that of relatively normal internet activity in the internet space? Um, do you, do, or how do those from the dark web connect to and interact with children? Or, or offenders uh, compared to you know the the, the open uh, internet during the COVID. I think we can perhaps uh, apply this question to the COVID nineteen um, yeah. yeah. pandemic. I think you have some data. So we um, 
what we did in, in exploiting isolation, we, we gave an example uh, of one of the forums within the darknet. Uh, and that forum was particularly, those uh, couple of forums actually, and they were particularly concerned with um, what they call capping, which is uh, essentially capturing video streams uh, that are produced by children uh, for various different reasons. Uh, so it can be that they are produced because the child is being sexually extorted or coerced. It can be that they are exchanging material with, uh, with a peer. It can be they, be, they believe they're exchanging with, uh, with a peer when it's actually uh, an adult. Um, or it can be that they are broadcasting, uh, unfortunately, um, their, their own abuse online in order to get likes uh, uh, and to, to gain popularity and status and so on, which is to me rather tragic, but it is the reality. And what we saw was that there was an increase in, in, in the, the material that was being shared in, in these particular forms related to capping, and that they had also uh, set up a, an additional form in, in relation to this in, a, in order to enable it. Uh, and both of them had a significant following in terms of numbers, and both of them were on the dark net. Um, so to us, it was, a, it was an indication of where their interest lay at that particular time, uh, and that, uh, that they saw this as a fruitful uh, and useful way uh, to gather and exchange and distribute data between themselves and make it available to one another uh, in order to, uh, to be able to have access to it and to re-victimize and to, to re-abuse, essentially, uh, these children. Now, so that material comes from various different sources and in different ways that I've described, but it, most of it will come from, from the clear net because the interaction between offenders uh, and victims on the dark net is very low uh, because that's not the way the dark net is built. Uh, it's built to ensure that people are anonymized uh, and, uh, and that their identity is not available to, to one another and, the, and making connections as a result, it takes a lot more effort there than it does uh, on the clearnet. So what they will do is they will source this material from the clearnet and then they will post it on the darknet or they will begin the relationships uh, that they want to uh, in an open form, then they'll move it to a private form, which is something that we're all uh, very well aware of uh, as, a, as a modus operandi. Uh, and then within that private form, uh, they will then uh, abuse the children uh, themselves. Occasionally, it has been the case that we have seen um, where groups have formed in the dark net in order to do this particular type uh, of abuse, particularly the, the, the capping and so on. So the proportion of, of uh, offending directly against children, which is taking place uh, in the dark net, is very low. Uh, but what the dark net does is it amplifies uh, and, uh, and at an order of magnitude uh, the actual abuse and re-victimization of those children uh, through the exchange of that material among those who are who are uh, um, who are frequenting that space, and it uh, also uh, enables them to amplify the idea among themselves that this type of abuse is okay, uh, that it's a, an acceptable thing for them uh, within their society to do. Uh, and that uh, that this is is the right place to do it because it protects them from being detected. I hope that answers the question. It's very clear. Thank you very much, Kahal. We'll we'll move on. Um, we have six minutes left, so we will take uh, one last question before we wrap up. And it's from Abilash Nair and asking an interesting question about the how we regulate safe generating materials, um, and and the tension between. Um, you know, the, the, the laws that criminalize, criminalize uh, child sexual abuse material, that they were, you know, drafted with the objective of protecting children from predatory um, adults. But that now we see that the data is suggesting that there is a steep rise in self-generating images uh, by the young children themselves. And then, then uh, if we apply those laws, um, um, then we will criminalize uh, children's behavior uh, but at the same time, we need to deter these type of behaviors that can be harmful. Uh, so uh, Abilash is wondering what the panel thinks of, of where, how do we find a balance? And it's a very tough question. Uh, Yuta, you want to answer that? Yeah, Please. yes, only a, a quick answer. I do think, first of all, we need to differentiate between children who are forced or even blackmailed to take these images and children who do that deliberately. 
I, I would say it's somehow uh, at a certain age, uh, exploring your own uh, sexual orientation, your personal development. It might also be part of that process to, to take images. But then we come to the question that we even raised uh, uh, earlier. Uh, it's the difference between taking an image and spreading the image. So, and, and that we, we need to, to address the issue that uh, of course, children have a right to develop their own personality, their identity, and that also sexual orientation is part of that process. At, but, but then we need to ask whether they do that deliberately or are forced to do that. And what about spreading these images all over the internet? And then they are probably also misused by other people. And so we need also to talk about how we can stop the spreading of these self-generated images. I, I would not talk about criminalizing children uh, by law for doing for taking images, but it's it might be a criminal act to spread that around the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very clear answer. Do you, do, you, do you want to add to that on that particular point, anyone? Yes, Beban, please go ahead. Just just to just to say. Uh, uh, to underline the fact that actually where the law has been developed without this concept in mind that children might uh, um, uh, self-generate these images, I think we have to decriminalize children. So we have to take action. So, so I would agree 100% with uh, Yuta on this point, but there may be sometimes some places where we actually need to make an intervention in existing law because it didn't imagine this scenario. Um, and uh, very, very few children should be criminalized for this sort of activity. I mean, you know, only um, in very, very extreme cases where, uh, uh, should, you know, not, not the social sharing. And there is a problem, and I know there's a problem even in our primary schools, which means kids under the age of 11 are being put on the sex register. I mean, that's just, it shouldn't happen. I think, I think it's a topic that uh, deserves a session on its own. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll take the opportunity to refer the, the participants uh, to a very nice campaign, uh, a video that is on Europol website. You can see, uh, find the videos. It, it says, if I, from the top of my head says no, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's in all the European languages. And for those who are not from Europe, um, you, you, you'll find uh, either English speaking, Spanish speaking or French speaking. Um, and, and other languages that you might need, but it's very well done and it, it speaks for itself. You can use it. I do use it personally to trigger discussions around the, the risky behavior of self-generating and solutions. And of course, uh, there are other material out there. Um, um, you can find it in the e-safety commissioner, the Australian e-safety commissioner website and other organizations. Um, yes, Yuta. Oh, sorry, I thought you were raising your hands. Uh, we, we are wrapping up the session and we have one minute to go. And, and I, um, I would like to thank the speakers for their very valuable um, um, presentations, ideas, insights, and there are uh, certainly um, key takeaways um, that we can um, you know, um, take with us. And, and um, I'm, I'm tasked with doing a report, so I have plenty of notes and we have recorded the session. So um, you've said so many, you know, interesting things and, and very applicable to uh, uh, our respective um, field of work that uh, I would like to thank you for the bottom of my heart and also acknowledging that some of you had to wake up very early this morning to connect and, and, and uh, but it's all for the cause as, as Kahal said at the very beginning. Um, I, I, I would like to, before I end the call, I would like to make a call to the participants because the IGF uh, this year uh, is initiating a call for voluntary commitments, um, um, is asking all the participants and the speakers to this uh, year, uh, to the, the virtual IGF to make um, a pledge um, to move forward the goals of the Internet Governance Forum and, and, and the recommendations from the Digital Corporation Roadmap. I invite you um, from wherever sector you belong to, to go to the website and look for the web form where you can uh, make a commitment uh, so that within the next year until IGF 2021, you commit to take forward one of the 
uh, actions and, 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 and the, um, the goals of the Internet Governance Forum. With that, um, we can end the session today uh, because I suppose we will be cut off if I don't stop now. Uh, I thank all of you and I wish you a very good uh, day if you're starting the day and a good evening if you're ending the day. Thank you very much to all and to our participants. I hope you enjoyed the session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for excellent moderation. Bye. <laughs> thank you, Dutta. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.